overly excited to be talking to Devin Bromhall, uh, marketing strategist, agency advisor, and former CEO of Animals Today. We chatted through a wide range of subjects, including her specific story for why she decided to move move on from animals for those not aware that's also a content marketing agency it was super exciting to talk to someone who had also uh run uh, a content marketing agency that i really respected so uh them and animals are a group i really uh thought did great things and uh given her her moving on thought it was an appropriate time to come on the program talk about the state of things her struggles uh with the the lack of creativity in content marketing had some good back and forth of how that kind of like plays into demand gen and uh, metrics that many companies uh, ask us to kind of report up to them and, and some of the limitations of doing that. We had a great discussion on community as well, a big passion point for her and something she's seen uh, have a lot of value in organizations and why it's sometimes difficult to get that done. So it was a super uh, fun conversation uh, with Devin. So, uh, enjoy it. And as one note, we did have a little bit of a mic issue for the first half or so. Um, but, uh, resolve that around halfway through. So enjoy, enjoy the talk. Devin, I am excited to have you here. It's been a long time. We we're just talking about this before this conversation, but, uh, super respect you and the animals team and Same. glad I could, uh, finally connect with you and, and chat content marketing today. I know. I can't believe it's taken this long. Like running yeah, around yeah. each other for years. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But we made it happen. That's the important part. So uh, glad we did. And uh, I mean, obviously a big story for you personally in your life is that uh, you stepped down as the CEO of Animals. Obviously, that was a pretty pretty big step for you. And as a content marketing agency uh, CEO myself, uh, someone in a similar shoes as you, obviously think about that context and curious, like what, what led to, to that decision? What, um, yeah. What brought you to today? It was, it's funny. A lot of people have been asking me this question and it's just, it's the answer is somewhat banal and uninteresting. So, you know, I, I was working animals for four and a half years and, you know, the cool thing about working with Walter and the team is, you know, when Haley and I joined in 2018, we had a lot of strong uh, opinions about how the company should be grown and built. And obviously with my extensive content marketing background, Haley's extensive customer support background or customer service background, um, you know, we, we kind of like we came in guns blazing a little bit. We knew what we wanted to do. And Walter was really cool about just kind of letting us do that. Um, and so it was the first time and it was a, it was an inflection point in my career, I guess, where I was learning something again, you know, I kind of mastered this sort of marketing thing and now I was being challenged in a new way. It was really exciting. And that was four and a half years, right? Took over as CEO March of 2020. So right in the middle of pandemic, I'm really proud of how we, got through it and thrived through it. And, you know, this year hit and it was a new set of challenges. We were, you know, for all intents and purpose, purposes ready for it. And then, you know, it came to a point where sort of two things happened simultaneously. One, Walter and I had sort of differing visions about how we, where to go next and how to sort of overcome this. The what was pretty aligned. The how was a little bit different. And the thing is, it's, 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 it's so boring and mathy when it comes to this relationship and the decisions you make. It's like, my job is to protect the company. It's Walter's company. If we're not aligned in that fundamental way, what's going to happen is the company is going to suffer because he and I are going to be disagreeing behind the scenes and things are going to get really confusing and messy for the company. And that was my job. He employed me. He gave me this job to protect the company. I said, okay, well, I'm going to be the problem here. And he owns it. So ultimately, if we're not in alignment, he can be that veto card. But if I'm not behind it and I don't believe in it, I'm not going to be able to sell it to my team. And so it was, it was just a very boring. I was like, well, this isn't going to work. So, and I love Walter. I love animals. And so it didn't, it wasn't that like I was right and he was wrong or he was right. Neither of us were. 
but we just needed to be on the same page and we weren't. So I said, okay, that it's time for me to go. And it was in many ways, the simplest decision I've ever made in my career because I was so clear headed, which leads to the other side, which is, I think without knowing it, I was ready to do something for myself. I have worked for other people's companies my entire career and I've learned a lot. I am so grateful. I basically got paid to go to business school and Walter's like an amazing business school teacher. Even just talking to some other companies since then, I'm like, oh, you taught me a lot. Like these people do not, a lot of people don't know what they're doing and you did. So like, great, thankful. I just like, I'm a little bored making other people, other people's things succeed that aren't mine even a little bit, you know, it's like, I need it to be mine now. I've done enough. I, you know, so I think that was sort of unknowingly building in the background. And it was part of what made the decision so simple for me is it was just like, it's time. Makes sense. So essentially sort of were the CEO, but felt like you weren't truly in charge of all the decisions in some ways. So that sort no, of led false. Oh, not correct. Okay. <laughs> I was the entire okay. time. And Walter was very good about that. Like he, when he passed the company on to me and Haley, he said, you're in charge. And so we had a very traditional relationship, reported up to the board. He advised us, but the decisions were ours until this year when okay. <laughs> we realized, right. And this was like this summer when we realized, oh, we have similar views on the what. We don't have the same views on the how. And that was the moment where I said, okay, that was going to come a point where decision-making was going to get fuzzy. Because again, it's not my company. So at the end of the day, the power that I have is still given. Makes sense. Yeah, that's tough. It's tough. Um, uh, yeah, in, in some ways. I mean, it is possible to, yeah, it always gets dicey. There's no perfect scenario. Um, we thankfully... Uh, I don't think we've shared this too clearly. Now I'm going to share it on this podcast, but we, we did, uh, we now have private equity investment as part of Siege. I don't know if I, you're aware of that, if we ever talked about that, but um, technically not fully my company anymore. Um, thankfully, yeah, in a decent spot where our investors have been, have been good with us um, so far. Uh, but I, I totally respect that and, and where you've, where you've come and where you're at now to make that choice in terms of, uh, doing something for yourself. That was pretty awesome. Clear, clearly got a ton of great feedback when you did that. Uh, yeah. All yeah. things considered. <laughs> and the experience changed me, right? So if this, you know, if we had been, had the same sort of set of circumstances, say last year, it's possible that things would have been different. I think what happened is this, the experience of running this company changed me to a point where I had such strong ideas about what I wanted and how I wanted to do it. That, you know, so it's not like, oh, you know, I think people try to make everything so dramatic, like some <laughs> big conspiracy happened. I'm like, nothing happened. It was like, <laughs> we just weren't. And so, but my opinions now are so much stronger that I was like, I don't want to be sweet. I don't want, I, I feel this and I know this for me and right or wrong, this is, this is what I want to do. And so it's like, I couldn't, there wasn't like the same compromise available to me that there used to be. And that's when I think the sort of founder mindset comes into your brain where you're like, oh, you know, I have spent my life massaging, compromising, meeting the bill. And I was like, nope, my beliefs here are too strong. I can't actually, I can't, I can't do it any differently. Makes sense. So, so I mean, one of the things I read into the, just the decision which maybe there's something here to it as well uh, that you, you sort of touched on your LinkedIn post, which we'll share in the show notes. But I was curious, like, obviously you, you said there's no big thing in the background uh, as a content marketing agency owner. I'm like, Oh, she, th she's like not believe in the future of like this offering or something like that. Was there anything to that? I mean, you can be clear on that. Uh, no, no. And yeah. that's what like, again, there's just like, the most important thing, <laughs> this is like the exhaustion of the past two years and people trying to make so much of things that aren't. And I think you probably see this too, where a lot of times, you know, we would make a decision and the team would be like, 
this is clearly some big, some other thing that happened. I'm like, (laughs) so most of the decisions that we make as leaders are not that interesting. Like a lot of times they're based on very basic things. And it's just because you have to obfuscate certain things in terms of protecting people's privacy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when you message that to the wider team, that it seems like it's like there's something there when there isn't. Um, and I think the same is true for me. So no, I absolutely, content marketing is in my blood. I believe in it more than I ever have before. I believe it's having a transformative moment, which animals was like, we were in the background and still are uh, paying attention to, adapting to, noticing, kind of creating a stance on. So no, it has nothing to do with our offering, the industry. We were already in the process of evolving it to, you know, meet modern, mo- these modern times. <laughs> so nice. it's, it's That's good. yeah, there's no, it has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with that. It's, 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 this is, I think my, and we'll talk about this later when you inevitably ask me an SEO question, but I do... <laughs> I do believe that content marketing has been over, uh, it is, it has been over aligned with performance marketing and thus lost some, lost some of its value and therefore customer satisfaction. And so where I was really pushing us towards is like content marketing is a brand play. There are measurements you can attach to it, but if you sit down and try to make it like performance marketing where you, I can't tell you the number of founders that would come to me, these like spreadsheets and they're like, see, we did these search terms and this is how much money. And they would try to like show how much revenue they were generating. And I'm like, yes, great, good. But I'm like, that's not, that's not it. It's very reductive. It's not going to, it may aid in your business at certain times in your growth, but it's not going to sustain it forever. And it doesn't help yeah, build a brand. Sense. Like there's no lasting value to it. It's the same as like, if you're going to do that, then just like, you know, do paid search or something, which I actually don't fully believe that either, but you, you know what I mean? It's the same concept. And so like, I think that we are at a renaissance moment for content marketing. And that's, what's got me really excited. And I think that just because we're in the middle of, you know, this recession where a lot of people are having to pull back their marketing budgets, that doesn't mean that that has to be put on hold. I think it's actually a great time to start exploring that more deeply. Yeah, I like that. It reminds me of uh, Refine Labs take, who I'm sure you've heard of Refine Labs, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. They somehow pulled this off of like not much, to my understanding, not much attribution present. I'm sure they get like brand searches through like dark social and what have you to show what they're doing. Uh, but th- that gets dicey, obviously, in economic climates. Um, for sure. I mean, I agree. I would agree with you. Uh, and that is a, is a tough part of what we do. Uh, I do like, hopefully it's like you, you borderline, you hit that baseline of like the math is just, it's positive. And yeah. hopefully you can do something creative on top to really drive brand and, and what have you. It, it is tough in an agency environment to do that yeah. um, from what we've seen anyways. Yeah. And it's like, don't go to one side or the other. So I'm not saying don't focus on SEO at all because SEO is more than just like there's content SEO and there's sort of like technical SEO. And so like, you know, you can't also say you can't using the term SEO is too broad in and of itself in terms of like how you actually like what you're actually deploying for each individual company. So and I'm not saying like go off and flit around and, you know, <laughs> focus. And I'm not saying, you know, it's sort of like what's the there's a pie and there's multiple pieces in the pie and you should, you know, however many there yeah. are depends on your business and your stage and your growth, whatever. But like you need multiple pieces, not just one. And I think that especially, and it, you probably see this too, like agencies, the requests can get reductive. They're like, oh, you're an agency that does X. So we need you to do X. But we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are the outcomes you're trying to achieve here? And then how can we serve a piece of that? with content marketing versus like, can you write us these blog posts? Can you, you know, get us these search terms, whatever. It's like, you're, you're missing the point already. So are you essentially saying a lot of the time 
it, it was hard to get out of that box of like keywords and those core KPIs to be able to get brand branded buy-in essentially. It Am is because, right? you know, agency, the, the agencies are a, you're constantly being held to your ROI, right? And so if we don't have something tangible to show pretty quickly, the question becomes, well, what are you doing for us? That didn't do that blog post didn't do anything. And because there's a sort of mindset that each individual blog post, like traffic and you know, ranking and all that is like, well, that's like this post is like, here's the picture, right? <laughs> yeah. The post is way down here as part of that strategy. And it's really hard to keep people on that sort of like on that vision mm -hmm. to help you understand that this is one part of a bigger thing because you know that's in I experienced this as an in-house marketer you know you have these big ideas and you start to deploy them and then all of a sudden the founder will be like well what are you doing <laughs> what what is this I'm like yeah. every month I talk about this I write you this long report with numbers and a repeat of the video and it's just like what does this mean you know and so it's like you know, you're constantly having to keep, and I think it's more challenging for agencies, right? Because you're not part of the team. So it's harder to, and that's something that we always battled with and we're continuing to iterate on. It's like, how can we maintain that trust to keep doing what we're doing so we can show real results, not just those incremental, like this blog post got, you know, <laughs> X number of visitors, like who cares? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I could see CMOs, like you'd have to come in through the CMO essentially to hopefully have that understanding. But if you don't, we don't often cut, we frequently do, but not all the time. It's not probably a majority percentage where if, if you're not the CMO who's understanding those things, they're going to be like, eh, well, where are the metrics on these things? Well, also the CMO is getting pressure too. So if we don't come yeah. in, if we're not showing results for them fast enough you know, they're, they're still getting that pressure. And so, you know, again, th those types tend to be easier to work, with, especially like bigger companies. I think they understand and have more like, um, bigger companies have more bandwidth for longer turnaround times, you know, things like results, they understand, okay, this is going to take three months, you know, to really get, going or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whereas younger companies just don't really have, you know, they're working on a timeline. So it's harder for them to withstand that, uh, which I completely understand. Especially now. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Especially now. <laughs> Tough time for all those SaaS companies for sure. Got to extend runway. And curious as a content marketing uh, CEO, previous CEO, like beyond that frustration, which is a great one. I uh, definitely can hear you though there in terms of the, the complications we face as agency agencies in the space. But was there anything else you kind of saw um, from a content side that you felt like was a struggle or maybe it's like present tense that might be interesting to people? Yeah, our biggest challenge is one that you would never imagine that you would have with a company paying you to do the exact work, which is we could get them aligned with strategy. We could get them aligned with approach. When it came down to getting them to approve specific ideas, number one biggest challenge from the time I started. Oh, wow. Interesting. So when it comes down to the actual, you know, this is the topic of the post. This is the, you know, we could even get them on board with a content calendar, sort of. And we started doing the content calendar approach. Like you're going to improve 90 days worth of ideas just so we could do the work for them. And it was unbelievable how over years challenging it was. And I think there are two reasons that I recall that came up a lot for smaller companies. It was, fear. Attaching yourself to 
that title. Oh, is that the per- is that exactly right? And oh, there's a little nuance here, and I'm not really sure. Like that was really hard, and I understand it honestly because when I I still to this day get a little bit of sort of LinkedIn stage fright. If you ask me to talk in front of a room full of people, you I'm gone. I don't even think, you know, I'm just like, I'm myself hopelessly, but there's something about the performance of online where I, I think it through when I write something and I get nervous and I, I still get butterflies in my stomach when I post certain things. Cause you've seen my posts, they tend to be pretty honest and unfiltered. And so they get really good engagement. So you should do it more often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they get really good engagement engagement for how sporadic I am at posting. Right. So, you know, that but but it it makes me nervous and so i think when you get the earlier stage companies where the founders sort of person is still tied to the company really closely i think they get a little bit scared and they don't want to commit and you know just sort of like that whole thing also the second thing is time constraint and that goes across you know you get all ready to go and you want to start and, you know, it's just like, you don't, even with the bigger companies, they're like, got these, and then we can't get them to say yes, or things are changing from on high. And so we'll get going on something. And they're like, oh, it has to change. And so those were two of the bigger ones. But I would say the, the, the more interesting challenge is the one around fear, because what I want to tell all these people, <laughs> it doesn't matter at all, because no one literally no one cares about you. No one cares at all about you. They care about themselves <laughs> first. So they're going to forget everything you say constantly. You can fit, you can change it later. The best thing that you could do is put a, a post out there where you miss the entire mark or you miss the mark on a little bit of a thing. And then you get all that feedback and you engage with your community And then you change it. You're like, hey, guys, thank you so much. (laughs) Now your community cares about you a lot more. Yeah, you're starting power users. I used to run communities when I worked at this personal organization app, SpringPad, that's now gone. And my job was to go show them early iterations of a new version and say, tell us where we messed up. Man, did they shout our praises from the rooftops. These people used to (laughs) wish me happy birthday online long after I left the company. Merely because I brought them into the process. And so, you know, I'm just like, put just shit out content. Make it good, (laughs) you know, make it good and opinionated and strong, but just like, and take that feedback and use that to improve. No one's going to remember the early stuff that maybe wasn't perfect. No one cares as much as you do. Just get attention, get people in your orbit. So that's like my, that's the one with like a more useful takeaway (laughs) than like people are busy, especially... But I do think that's going to be important for agencies, right? So agencies right now are going to be struggling with, they've got smaller marketing teams that they're working with. These marketing teams have no one. And so <laughs> they're going to have to find ways to assist. If you want to kind of stick around with those companies, you're probably going to have to invest a little bit more in making their lives easier so you can keep doing the work for them and showing value. Makes sense. And uh, completely with you, we, we see that uh, for sure. We used to do more kind of like, creative or like extra, or like trying to go, I, I don't know. I don't think we ever tried to go viral, but like more like link baity type stuff in our work, uh, where you get difficulty getting things approved. Uh, you probably hate our process, but we're now like spreadsheet numbers in a spreadsheet, uh, trying to get things approved in bulk. And I'm sure attachment to search volume, it's more straightforward on average helps there. And one of the things I'm curious your take, like honestly, some of the things you you say, I I agree, and I wonder. Um, one of the ways we've we try to push our team to be creative within those constraints of search, essentially, is our is our model. Uh, essentially, do you think it's really is it how I, it is achievable? Of course, like those people that are open to those kind of like brand creative ideas, and they're they matter and they're necessary. Do they work nicely coming from an agency, do you think, for the constraints and reasons you said? Oh, Is it sure. Easy? Yeah. I mean, there's tons of agencies, you know, advertising agencies, design agencies. There's tons and tons of creative based agencies out there who fill, you know, who are 
making commercials and websites. Yeah, that's and fair. So ab- absolutely, I do. I, I think it it really depends on your your reputation really matters as an agency. And I think one of the things that I realized a little bit too late was that, you know, for example, we started hearing this narrative from customers where we were an SEO agency. I was like, oh, my. <laughs> That's us. That's it. Exactly. But it was because I had grounded our strategy too much in search. It was like, okay, have a search-based strategy so we can show results right away. And then we can get them to, like, we can push them more once we've earned their trust. That was the philosophy. I was wrong. That was, no. Because then they were they like, were. okay, well, we want search content. And we were like, okay, well, that's not necessarily going to work for all of you in the same way. And it didn't, all it did was create a reputation around search. So, and I don't think search is bad. Search is great. You should do it. But I just don't think that like, look, they're kind of two different things. I used to believe that it's like, okay, if you want to rank for a term on this post for a SaaS company, and you can make the post really like robust and creative, like Search content can be more compelling than, you know, just a basic, okay, here's how to do X, you know, here's how to make my lame Christmas ornaments that I made last night, which actually (laughs) turned out great. Turns out melting crayons in a plastic, a clear glass ball makes the most ornate uh, ornaments imaginable. (laughs) But it's a perfect example because when I read that blog post, I scrolled past all the creative BS at the top and I was like, Show me how to do it. And so I think where we've, where I, my belief system is centering now is let search content be instructive and kind of boring. That doesn't apply for every search term because not every search term isn't like a how to search term. So I'm, I'm sort of bucketing sure. it within that one sort of instructional category because that deeply applies to B2B SaaS because that's usually the types of posts they're trying to rank for. So, you know, for the, you know, Make the boring ones boring. Just help people understand how to do better. When I used, I learned how to do, I learned my entire content marketing career online because back then they didn't have content marketing courses. And so I just read HubSpot and Sprout Social and Customer IO and all, you know, all those companies, Hootsuite, Buffer, they taught me how to do every part of my job and then get better at it over time as all the rules continue to change, you know? And it, they didn't do it by, being creative, they were like, here is exactly what to do. Here is a spreadsheet. Rand Fishkin's got his like whiteboards, you know? And that really helped. And so it's like, separate it. Be instructional. Have your like, you know, make it more like support content. The how-tos are more like support content. They're the things that sort of like ground you in that library that I think blogs have become. They're really just like libraries. The creative stuff is around community building and I'm going to say thought leadership, but I hate that <laughs> so much. Um, but that style of sort of more narrative style, analytical type of content, that should be something separate. I think trying to join the two together was a mistake because it's just, fl- it comes off like fluff. Makes It makes sense. I, I agree. I mean, I, I, I think there's limited room for creativity. One thing Bernard... Um, from ClearScope recently yeah. talked about, which I like, is just ca- occasionally, and you had a great presentation, someone from, I forget, was it Ryan Law on your team on like counter narratives? Yeah. Um, and I think the danger is you don't want to force that. But if you, if it makes sense, like we talk, I, my example I like giving is we made an article on manual link building because we don't do it anymore. But if you search for that, we kind of have a counter narrative and it makes sense for that, but you wouldn't want to do it every article, of course, or it comes off as fluff as you kind of would describe. And that's kind of the point. I think that's where you, you actually absolutely nailed it. SEO gets coupled with this concept of create a repeatable process that you can do over and over and it will just work. And I don't have to think about it anymore. That's not SEO. That's not marketing. That's not content, right? Nothing is meant to be and the problem is we're serving a community where that's all they want to do. These are software people, product people who are like trying to find that like back end repeatable solution that Scalable, removes yeah. the need for humans to do stuff, right? And that's not what this is ever meant to be. SEO is meant to be nuanced. 
content is meant to be nuanced. And so you're supposed to have multiple, and even within each pie slice, right? You're like, have these little mini, okay, well, within content, you're like, okay, we're going to do our thought leader, whatever we're going to do, whatever it is. And so I think that's like, that's the point is it's not meant to be automated. It's meant to be nuanced and creative and it's meant to adapt over time as your company reaches different stages of growth, different stages of saturation within your own market, et cetera. Like you're going to have to deploy different things. So for sure. You made me think of something I've heard your company, uh, past company talk about was, uh, AI. I'm just curious your opinion of like how that is fitting in and where you see that going. Yeah, we were, I was really excited with some experiments that Ryan was running behind the scenes with AI. And look, much like everything, I don't think it's as dramatic as everybody's making it. (laughs) Ryan's like, everybody just like likes to get fussed about stuff now. I'm like, can you just like sit, sit down, sit down and relax. (laughs) I think that whatever, wherever you can automate work that doesn't require, that, that isn't important for a human brain is incredibly useful because you save more capacity in that human brain for the unique nuanced stuff, the creative work. And so it's not just, you know, where my brain might have spent, you know, a third or two thirds of my time on the like, structure and outline or like kind of doing research or putting some basic stuff together. Now I've got that one to two thirds to deploy just to the part that makes it special and unique. Great. Cool. We're going into a recession. Teams have less resources. Can you replace a portion of those resources with something? Great. Cool. Awesome. Do it. I don't know. Like, and what, what I've like, I have this dream of when I have time on my hands someday, you know, it's like, <laughs> how can you use it creatively? What are things that like, I still have, I feel like we've just, there's ways that you can, I, I believe it can be more creatively deployed and I just don't know what those are yet. So I don't, I don't like, I don't think it's that, I don't think it matters that much. I think it, I think it matters a lot in terms <laughs> of like how it's going to impact the industry in the future. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but like, I don't think it's bad or I don't think it's cha- like, I, I don't think that's going to be the thing that fundamentally changes content marketing. It just changes how content marketing or certain aspects of production are done and where people's energy and what roles people have, which I think is really cool because if I were a content marketer right now. I'd be like, wait a minute. I can <laughs> jump from like producer doing boring work to like, creative strategist like now maybe this whole like this middle person and now there's there's like a huge career opportunity for me because instead of having to like walk many steps like I did I could go from like here to you know a mid-level position paying 85 grand a, a year or two out of college because all this other stuff is taken care of by you know a robot or whatever so <laughs> I don't know I, mean, I think that's kind of like I think my vision the visionary part of me is like wait this is a huge opportunity for a lot of people in a lot of different ways we just don't even know yet. And for now, just like use it and bang on it and see how it could benefit you. Yeah. Agreed. How I've been playing in with it so far, I haven't seen a ton of use case Um, for us. Honestly, I do like, I think it was Lex is in one of the newer tools. They're all doing similar things with GPT-3, but they do have this nice setup where it can like creatively spit out multiple iterations on your title I think that's kind of cool um, f- for post structure. It just feels jagged to me. Like it's hard as a, like, I think we're trying to create a premium product. And I know you all did that. And not every content agency does that necessarily, or it's good. Or maybe it's like small business scaled out. They don't need to do something super built out. Um, and if I'm a writer and I'm trying to create flow and process, and a lot of these tools I think are limited. Thankfully, because the internet doesn't get spanned with thousands and thousands of words of AI content, uh, you get these like jagged frameworks. It's inconsistent in what's spit out. I think to your point, like it's the same stuff that's found on the search result right now. Apparently improved versions of GPT-3. I just read yesterday, GPT-4 is coming in spring. Uh, maybe that'll be much better. I'm not sure, but it it just... I, I would agree. I'm like, right now, I don't even see the use case to give it to our team. Um, I'm worried it could kind of like have go 
to your point, less creative, which is not what we want with SEO content, uh, which is so hard to not, it's easy to go down that route, but th- that's sort of how we're thinking about it right now. Yeah. I mean, there's two, there's sort of two opportunities right now that I see one e-commerce. We could never serve e-commerce companies because they needed such a high volume of com- of content that we could never afford to write it cheaply enough based on our model to ever serve them. And we tried multiple times. So I think for really basic SEO content, it actually can work really well. We were That's more what we were experimenting with it. Um, and then the second Agreed. thing is just basic outlines. So what I was really interested in was the title iterations, because sometimes you just need help ideating. Like what if it's a helpful form of ideating where maybe you're with a new client and a slightly new subject matter and you're just doing all the research and you're, you know, immersing yourself and you need ideas or you need help getting to that flow state. Imagine putting in something and having it spit out, you know, because I think you can get pretty specific now with like kind of what you want, having it spit out multiple outlines. Look at those outlines. Look at examples of different ways that the you know topic could be structured, and use that to help you write your outline. Makes help sense. you write your headers. Like that's how I see it. So it's really it's, it's a it's an inspirational. It's a brainstorm. It's a helper. I think that's a really cool, compelling use case that could still save people a lot of time because instead of sitting there trying to imagine all these different outlines and headers and all that stuff. You kind of have these three and now all of a sudden you're like, oh, I see what it should be. And it's like, it could kind of give you an aha moment potentially. Uh, Your mind is very creatively grounded, which I love. Uh, Something that's interesting is when we think about deep, like we're really in the weeds SEO, obviously in our positioning, how the post is structured, it feels critical for those rankings. So it's like, is it structured in the exact way to match user intent is something we do emphasize. So that would be my like pause is uh, maybe a GPT-4 will get there. I don't feel it yet where they naturally would give you that out. I still like the, where you're going with inspiration, but yeah. in terms of the the simple structure that Google can understand, uh, maybe thankfully, I don't know. It doesn't seem like they're quite year, there yet. <laughs> With that, um, and luckily yeah. too, there's so much there already to help you structure the piece, right? Like you can go in and look at the related searches. Like you kind of know, you sort of ha- have the outline sort of given to you in that way, and so you you like in that sense, you sort of already know. But I don't know. I still think there's something there because you know, even if you were to give it the structure and say like these are the things like. What is it going to spit out in terms of the bullets? What is it going to spit out? You know, there's just stuff to be had. I think there's, there's, there's a usefulness. Um, but again, it, not for everything, as you mentioned, like you, you, your, your posts to a certain degree are preordained. It's more for, you know, other places where you're trying to um, either become immersed or brainstorm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, um, It's interesting. Yeah. It's like you're using it creatively and then we're the SEO, we're not robots, but like SEO people. And then my concern is that people will turn into robots using it in a little ways. Uh, We're probably a little more inclined to potentially do that because of the nature of search needing you to do a certain thing. It doesn't mean it's the right answer or wrong. I'm sure there are plenty of content marketers that are senior who'd use it in the correct fashion and maybe we'll get there and tools will get there and uh, we'll, we'll use them, but currently we're not using it for a lot of those reasons anyway. I think it's a fair concern to worry that people are going to abuse it. And I think that's why, you know, like, I think that's why they're being so careful about like how they roll it out and release it and the rule, like, you know, I could very easily see not all, for example, SEO companies are as sort of, uh, have integrity. (laughs) <laughs> As you do. And so like, I mean, you sure, can definitely yeah. see people abusing this, you know, in the same way that like 20, was it 20 years ago, people used to put like random keywords in the code of a post to make it rank. Like, 
hack your website. <laughs> exactly. Like I, I would say that's definitely a concern uh, that, you know, but for people like us, it's like, I'm just curious what people are going to do. Yeah, for sure. It's exciting for, and hopefully to your point, we just get more creative on average and that's the use case of it, not a flood of uh, vanilla content essentially. Or make content certain aspects of what we do more affordable to earlier stage companies, right? Like maybe there's a way that we can subsidize some of the human costs, thus have an offering that helps, you know, launch early stage companies where right now we're a bigger investment for them. That was something that we were really curious about, right? How can we be more approachable? Like, how, can this help us serve a different market? Yeah, it's interesting. Definitely something to think about for sure. And uh, transitioning from AI, because uh, we're not robots yet. You talked about community uh, and your role there at a past company. I don't know if you actually worked with Lattice. I feel like I remember Lattice being referenced as a good community um, touch point. You have some some takes on that or like what, how, how can community, community be a bigger part of, of what we do as content marketers? Well, first of all, <laughs> The first thing that marketing, I hate this about us, and but like we kind of ruin things pretty quickly. So the second people started catching on to this concept of community, which I think really started escalating during the pandemic, it immediately becomes a buzzword and people stop doing interesting things. (laughs) That's a gross generalization. There's plenty of people doing interesting things, I'm sure. Although if you ask me on this call... I will probably not be able to come up with a good example because somehow I forget all good examples while I'm live. <laughs> but uh, I think that I was just talking about this yesterday with Ashley Foss and our like weekly rants. And we were talking about Twitter and I was talking about how this, the potential implosion of Twitter is actually potentially facilitating what the web three enthusiasts have wanted, but in a somewhat different way, which is not so much complete decentralization, but a breaking apart of these platform monoliths into smaller micro communities. So the big question has been, you know, where, what are the Twitter alternatives, Mastodon, Discord, and, you know, Post and Plunk or Plink or whatever, Hive. (laughs) And, you know, people are, well, where should we go? You know, what are we, you know, where are we go? And my answer is like, where does, where's your, where are your customers? Where are your followers, your audience, whoever you like, where are they? What do they want? Ask them, where do you guys want to go? Do you, let's build something really small, like build something of your, you know, Atlassian has this uh, community of um, like, they have their own kind of Atlassian community or whatever, and they've built it around themselves. I'm like, This is actually an opportunity for brands to build community around themselves in a very altruistic way that breeds more loyalty because they're giving a safe space. Twitter's a dumpster fire. I don't, I don't post there because I'm too, like, if you share this on Twitter, I'm not going to do anything. I'm too, (laughs) it's a mob. I'm scared of it. I like, I only observe now. I'm too scared. Like, I'm never going to be on there again. I don't know. Maybe that's not true. Never say never. But, <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's less about okay. Where's the next platform? There is no next platform, and I think that's a big opportunity for people. Is instead of focusing on, and this goes back to remember the, the when it was like everybody finally got off the um, traffic train. They were like, okay, vanity metric. They realized that it wasn't connecting as you know linearly down the funnel and that it was more complex. And so they have to think about the types of traffic they're bringing in and which cha- channels to funnel down to, et cetera. The same thing's going to happen with community where it's not about aggregating. It's, okay, I have 18 million followers here. It's like, no, where do you have the strongest engagement? I was talking to John Bonini yesterday, some good content. He started a newsletter and his subscriber count objectively isn't huge, but he's all these people wanting to sponsor him. He's booked out with sponsorships because he's got a super engaged community. His open rate is off the charts. People are <laughs> so it's the va- it's the it's the it's the it's the engagement of the community, it's the strength of the community over the size because that's been the big problem all along. Even with Twitter when it was 
fine. People were spending tons of advertising dollars there, but it wasn't the platform that had the greatest ROI, right? And so I think it's more about where can you, how, how community is going to be transformative in its impact on brand's bottom line, not in volume, but in engagement. And in finding these, you know, really nurturing those power users or those influencers within your community who don't have hundreds of thousands of followers, they've got 10,000 or 5,000 or 2,000, but those people really look to them for advice and consult. That I think is a huge opportunity, which no one wants to hear from me right now. Like I guarantee the, 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 the collective eye roll of like investing in something that feels hard to measure and like it's going to be a lot of work is making a lot of people really nervous. However, the positive side of this is it's not- it's <laughs> Same not, thing. Same yeah, thing. It's not reliant on just your marketing team, your customer support team, your product team, your engineering team. You can get, you could bring multiple players into this endeavor in very specific ways that aren't taking up tons of time and the aid in this rich community that you're building so that it doesn't actually, which means it ends up not having to cost as much. The, the, the cost, the bottom line cost is mostly time and a very small sliver of multiple people's salaries, but like it's small. And a lot of times they'll probably just do it in their free time because they might actually end up really liking it. And so <laughs> I think that's like, and I think the thing that people, the other reason why people don't like this is that I can't give you a playbook for it because there isn't one. People are like, well, how do you do that, Devin? What's the playbook? And I'm like, there isn't one. And thank God, because playbooks <laughs> don't work anymore. Content marketing is out of place in maturity where you can't just deploy a simple playbook to make it work. That's a good thing. That means it's about to be more useful. Because when you can reduce something down to a playbook, it's only going to, it's either not going to work for, forever or it's only going to have sort of a, a micro impact. Once you have to start using your brain and creativity to make something work, then you have the opportunity to make something unique, which other people can't copy. And then kind of like they can't swoop in. And, yeah. Yeah. Take, but that's what take it was. Time. We were this brand that like shouldn't have worked. We didn't invest in search. We didn't in advertise. We didn't, but we, I stopped marketing the company a year ago, August. I was like, we we're fine. It's okay. Right. Like we, we kind of <laughs> shut up. but it's because we built a community around us and we were very generous to that community that both from the people who worked there and left in terms of educating them, we invested a lot of money in our people and we invested a lot of money in our audience through the blog that was completely illogical and had no, like the KPIs were <laughs> practically not. Not what the, yeah. <laughs> but guess what? We were thriving and we were considered one of the best you know, in our industry. And so I think that's like, you know, that's a thing. That's where community has something to offer. And I think that's what gets me really excited. Makes sense. I, I this is like a playbook question. So tell me you, there's not an answer. <laughs> I told, I mean, I totally agree. One of the like contextual things I'd love to hear more, like, do you think someone decides to move forward with community? Like, in my head, it almost feels like a different channel. Obviously there's content in that context, but is it a content marketing manager own that? Or is it just like a new person, like a community manager? It feels different to me, even though critical, important and supports content, but it feels like a slightly different lane. I don't know if you disagree or um, what you're- No, that's that actually probably the most important question you could have asked. Because <laughs> for something like this to work, you need investment from the company such that the investment has to, the decision has to be made very high up. And so to me, it doesn't matter who deploys it generally. I don't think there's a general role that deploys it. Like, I don't think there's a general answer to your question in terms of like, oh, it should always be the content marketer or it should always be, you know, your head of support or it should always be your product. Like, I don't think that that's, uh, I don't think there's an answer there and I don't think it matters. What matters is, is your company invested in this approach, both philosophically and financially? Because in order for that to work, you need 
the higher ups to motivate whatever folks in the company are required to help that community get off the ground and grow. And if you, for example, if I decide to build community and I've done this before and struggled with it where, you know, I decide as the content marketer, I was, you know, director of content. I, you know, we're going to do this, right? Fine. You can get budget. And they're like, cute. That's nice that you do that. You know, it helps God. I was really lucky. Our uh, founding team and specifically the CEO was really like believed in community. And so he gave me uh, a lot of sort of leeway there to explore. Um, But you like, there needs to be, you can't build a community around a brand with someone over here in content marketing doing it because eventually more people at the company are going to have to sort of get involved for it to be legit. And so I think it's more about um, less who deploys and who decides and gets really on board with it. That person probably doesn't have to do a lot of work besides internal influence and saying like, this is a thing and evangelizing it as they evangelize everything else. Mm -hmm. But you need that in order for it to work. That said, (laughs) You can bottoms up it and then prove the value later. It's just going to be a lot harder. So you could probably, you know, do it on the sly. Um, But I just think that it would be more impactful if you could do it from the brand down. Makes sense. Second question off of that is, so like community, I I agree. It's impactful. All that has a lot of uh, potential for people. Is there a community for every business? Is there a fit for everyone? How would someone who listens to this conversation as inspired from what you said under, understand whether or not a community is possible for what they do or maybe where it's like really a low-hanging fruit, not low-hanging to your point, but could be hugely impactful. Like how, what's the, how do you describe that kind of like gap potentially? Objectively, I don't believe there's a single answer to any question. So if you say to me, is there a community for everyone, every type of business? My automatic answer is probably not because there's no one answer to anything. And anyone who believes that is, I don't know, they're too binary in their thinking. That said, I think that the way you think about community matters in answering that question. So Community doesn't always have to look like a Facebook group or a Discord or, you know, a news, a sub stack. A community could be networking forums. So I'm thinking of some of those more offline examples like, you know, lawyers. Uh, you know, they could find, if you're a lawyer, usually I think... And again, I'm a little out of my depth here, but usually you're serving a certain area of law, which means you have a certain set of customers, in which case those customers are going to be somewhere. If you're a lawyer in a small town, your community could be town stuff. I don't live in a suburb, so I don't know what that looks like anymore, but maybe you're sponsoring certain nonprofit things. You're going to these, you know, you're getting involved in your community. That's community. That's biz dev. Now you're on everyone's mind and word of mouth. For animals, it looked like, you know, this YC community that just kept, there was like a thread asking about content marketing agencies and we were in it and it sent us business for years. Um, You know, so I think it really depends on your type of business and how you conceptualize community. For some types of businesses, it might be more analog, in-person types of communities. For, you know, SaaS companies, it might be, you know, if you're a developer community, you're going to build a community in a very specific way using specific, like a marketer should not lead that community, right? Or that marketer had to be previously been a developer or, you know, so I think, you know, it, it, it is completely and totally dependent on the customers you're serving or who you're, you want your audience to be and understanding where they are how they experience community, how they interact with people and finding a way to meet them there in a really authentic, genuine way um, and being there over and over again. So in a way, I think, yes, any business can, but I'm going to say no because I hate ultimatum answers. (laughs) 
just the version of it sort of, I think yeah. is the take here. And I would, I would agree with that. That makes sense. Uh, it sort of is a lead off of the first question, but did this, I mean, clearly you're passionate about it. And I mean, for good reason in terms of the value a community can build in, in different ways. Did this represent itself in your, your agency in any way, or is it just kind of like you wish more of your clients had, had done this kind of thing? I wish I had done this sooner. It's one of the things I left regretting. And also just the circumstances over the past two years, they they weren't the most aspirational in nature. So I never, I never got to see this to fruition, both in a product and in animals itself. We had a huge community around us of past and present clients, past and present content marketers. The whole foundation of the company was built on being a learning institution. And, you know, there were all these people floating around that were related to animals in content marketing. And I never did anything to bring that, those people together in a way that had a more exponential impact on the industry. And that's something that was really important to me. And I was really, I really wanted to do, but just, we didn't get to. So there's, we're like a planet and there's all these things orbiting around, but there's no like <laughs> matter or whatever the thing, you know, the, there's nothing to like bind them to the orbit. They're just sort of like accidentally, or they're, they're floating around by circumstance of having been involved with us in some way. And I would have liked to make that more intentional. Well, is that is that your next thing? Community. <laughs> Community agency. Have you heard of Fever B? I like I feel like I don't know any agencies that support consultancies besides this company. Um, I forget the founder, but they do a good job of like consulting on community from what I remember. And uh there's a need there for it. Someone's just gotta pave the way. Maybe that's your next thing. I don't know. That's a good segue to what is next for you, Devin? Like, what are you, what are you thinking about? What, what should people expect? Clearly not, don't go to Twitter to find yeah. you. <laughs> no. So <laughs> the answer is, I don't know. And, you know, people have been asking me since the second, I, I remember talking to Pep, like right after I left, he was like, Hey, let's just catch up. What's going on. And he's like, okay, Devin. So like, what are you going to do now? Cause you know, Pepe always has a plan. This man is like the most plan. Like I admire him so much for that. Cause he just <laughs> always know what's, knows what's next. He's like, okay, Evan, what are you going to do now? And I said, I don't know. He's like, okay, well, what are you thinking about? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, okay, well, what do you not want to do? I was like, I don't know. I don't think I should rule anything out right now. And you like his brain like broke in half. He's like, yeah, I thought you were one of us, Dev. Like he's just like you could see him being like hopeless. Like you're the person who's supposed to have a plan. <laughs> Panicking. So, um, uh, so, so to answer your question, I was very intentional when I left to be launch a curiosity phase. So, obviously, I have the benefit of being a somewhat semi public person in a very small community. So when something like that happens, I get a lot of people reaching out to me. And so I began by just absorbing that, talking to people. And that's kind of still where I'm at. And I've chosen a few sort of three different types of projects to see where my energy lies. And the interesting thing that has emerged is sort of a version of what you were implying, which is I... I like being a connector. What I said to my friend recently is I would love to make money just from networking. So like an example recently where that really worked out was I'm advising an agency. A friend of mine had to lay off some really talented staff because of the circumstances of the world, sent me their profiles and like their roles and what they were really strong at. Agency needed a person, person needed a job. It turned out I introduced those two and it worked famously. Um, people come to me needing certain services and I'm, oh, these are the agencies that I know that I really trust, et cetera. So it, it just feels really rewarding to me 
to be the person that helps other people out. And I think that has that strong community aspect to it. It's very, it, it connects back to the earliest phases of my career when I was building a content marketing, when I helped build a content marketing group in Boston that became the biggest marketing group there. And people loved it. You know, it's like, there's a, there's a core tenet of helpfulness, which is why I got into content marketing in the first place that I would like to see do, uh, I think I could see that turning into me 2.0. I don't necessarily, um, but I'm not ruling out, you know, people are like, are you going to go to another company? I don't know. Probably not anytime soon, just because like, you know, animals was a long-term relationship. It's going to take me some time to <laughs> separate from that. But for, for in the meantime, you know, if I can, if I can find a way to make a good living connecting people and helping them out, that'd be really awesome. Cause I love talking to people. I love meeting people and I think I naturally, anyone I talk to, I'm like, oh, and then you could do this. And then, like my brain starts, you know. <laughs> You're the um, strategist. Yeah, I'm an idea person. And so if I could help those, I come bring those ideas to fruition people, that'd be great. But I don't know exactly what that looks like yet, but I'm able to help some people out in the meantime. And so, you know, there will be a thing early next year, a okay. tangible thing, a tangible creative thing that I'm doing with somebody else. That will so there's one certain thing that is not probably going to pay the bills, but is a thing that I'm doing <laughs> to make me happy. So it'll make you whole. Yeah, yeah. I lo I've loved your word of uh, what brings you energy. I think that was good in observing the three things you were doing. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. My heart goes out to anyone running a company the past few years. It's been like the B side of this talk is like how absolutely and positively demoralizing it can be uh, with sort of the unique set of things in the world right now. Racing us, yeah. Yeah. It's been really nice to kind of get away from that for, and just, you know, um, only work with people who want my help and be able yeah. to choose. That feels really good. <laughs> that feels really yeah, good. Yeah. That's, that's nice when you're, yeah. Day, and choose me a lot. One, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And my dog, that's Henry. Great. Henry's yeah. living his best <laughs> life right now. He's getting, we're going on lots of walks and cuddles. And so. A lot yeah. of activity. So where will, is LinkedIn reliably a place people to find you and look for that notification? Somebody's like, do a website? I was like, it's like so 10 years ago. Like absolutely not. I don't <laughs> What is a, a blog these days? We do I not. Know. I liked can... your take on supporting uh, uh obviously refine lab does this as well but like you're we're sharing ideas not blog posts anymore on social um which is tough i mean for seo we essentially build this thing put it on the site mm -hmm. and for the most part we're just like sharing social images from the post but like yeah you can't distribute content anymore through social most of the time which is rough what is social anymore like twitter's having a moment no one uses Instagram apparently, except for like me and people older than me. Um, That's me. Uh, me also. Yeah, I'm like I'm not going to leave Instagram. Sorry, I, but I it's just for personal use, right? It's where I buy. It's look if you're e-commerce, you're doing great. I have spent a lot of money because of Instagram ads. My closet is much improved from all the beautiful clothing <laughs> kids, uh, hawked at me. But you know, Facebook, obviously, the whole like digital ad industry kind of being upended. You know, so it's like, what, what organic social media for B2B SaaS companies hasn't worked for a while, unless you pay for it, which would means it wouldn't be organic. So that's redundant. But so like, this is where, and this is why I think the community thing is sort of like this untapped, like Critical people are using the word a lot and they're not doing anything meaningful or different about it. And that's why there's a still a huge opportunity there, despite the fact you've it feels like it's oversaturated because people just keep using the term, but they don't actually know what it means, and they're not actually doing any interesting work around it. So, you know, yeah, uh, uh, it's essentially should be used in tandem. Everyone says like the the channel you own is email. Um, everyone says that. I've never heard someone say email plus community essentially, which is also true. Um, and I think maybe that's needs to be said more. To your point. Email is fraught on its own because it's 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 also a place where there's a lot of clutter still. And it's easy to get buried still, even though inboxes are way smarter now. And I'm sure there's somebody out there that organizes theirs way better than mine. 
But <laughs> I think the complementary sort of attachment to a brand that you can create will make that email more impactful, more opened, more read, because, you know, people are attaching, it's, it's, it's personified more than just the latest from, I'm trying to from think general. of an email I've even opened recently from a brand, <laughs> including ones yeah, where I point. like their content. Yeah, it's not guaranteed. Even people say you own this channel, you still, it's not guaranteed people are going to open that. And for that reason, it's more saturated than ever. Yeah, but it's multifaceted. Sure. Your relationship with your community, customer, whatever it is, whatever you call them, should be multifaceted. And it's the multifaceted nature of it that will make it stickier and more engaged. That's Yeah, definitely. That's yeah. There's your playbook. Well, I'm going to <laughs> You, uh, for people listening to this, I mean, definitely should shout out, uh, super bath community. You all did it. I don't know how much it was directly associated with animals, but they have a great content marketing community. Super um, bath. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Huge. Yeah. I find everybody there. Yeah. It's huge. I like, it, sorry, not huge as in, well, actually I think it is somewhat big, but it is huge also. I think. Yeah. Yeah. But Jimmy does a good job of making it small. He's got a team now, or he's got at least one person, I think. Helping him. So, I mean, I think it's the quality of the community and the moderation. <clears throat> moderation. <clears throat> um, so they, they're they still doing a really good job with it. It's, it's very well curated. And so I send everybody there because it actually does, like, it's a valuable, friendly, helpful community that I really, really strongly believe in. Agreed. Yeah, it's great for con content marketing focus just for the people listening to this. Uh probably skews a little more your background SaaS B2B. Uh, but I think there's a good mix there as well. Yeah. People. Yeah. Well, great, Devin. This was awesome. Uh, I appreciate you uh, coming on and chatting. And um, I'm excited about community and what's what's next for you. So I'll look forward to what you're sharing. It'll, yeah. it'll be a long thought out post. I have no doubt. Um, <laughs> <hear> it eventually. <laughs> Shared in a very messy way. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too nerve-wracking it'll no. it'll be good <laughs> <laughs>